Who's the speaker? Masitandaze. Almighty God, where you have called us to govern in this province, ask your help to make decisions and laws that will be just and will promote the interest of our people. on speed, but on Ons dino de ege vers weesheid sal gee, en ons moet die weesheid wel sal hou. En dat i ons sal help, om ons te kort kom en te oor kom. En al ons besluite aan i op te dra. Sigile lankosi li zwele tu nabandru balo. Umise lankosi uglu unga kwi pondu leitu. Kosi sigelela ya Afrika. Kina bandwa na bayo. Kokela nkosi inko keli zayo. Inike ukolo nkosi ya Afrika. All this we beg in your most holy name. Amen. You may all be seated. Good afternoon and welcome, honorable members, the honorable premier of the Western Cape and the leaders of political parties. And I must say in the house, I'm blessed that the, myself and the honorable deputy speaker are not alone. We've got here in our presence in our midst the Premier. Thank you, Honorable Premier, for joining us in the chamber. Um, Honorable Minister Bridell, thank you for joining us in the chamber. Honorable Minister Mitchell, thank you for joining us in the chamber. Uh, Honorable Minister uh, Simas for joining us in the chamber. Thank you very much. Can get lonely in the house, in the chamber alone. It's a big chamber, so it's lovely to have you here. We do have some guests, uh, which is nice. It's your parliament. You're welcome there in the gallery uh, to the guests that are here. Honourable members, in terms of the convention and in terms of the standing rules, these uh, hybrid sessions and, of course, um, this hybrid session is conducted in terms of the uh, standing rules as amended, which then suggests that all the provisions of the rules apply. That includes what we all know, that you don't activate your mic if you are not recognized, and you also do not heckle because it disrupts the order as we are in a virtual and in-person uh, forum. Uh, to our guests, um, members of the fourth estate, the media, I would, I would like to request that you enjoy the gallery, um, in that virtual gallery, and please do not activate your microphone, and equally do not activate your camera, as it will disrupt the proceedings. Um, Honourable members, um, I also see the Honourable, the Leader of the Opposition in the Chamber, uh, Ngozi Mtlegas. Thank you for joining us here. Um, Honourable Members, I might, you might have noticed there was something unique as we began with the proceedings today, that the 
mace was not carried by the sergeant at arms, nor the deputy sergeant, uh, sergeant at arms, but rather our very own uh, Mr. Charles Preda. Um, Charles Preda has been in the Western Cape Provincial Parliament for 35 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Charles Preda. I call him Charlie. He graciously accepts that and is always pleased with a smile. Mr. Preda worked in this works in this institution for more than two decades. I mean, for more than three decades. So he started on the first of September in 1986. Again, I would like the members to put their hands together for this gentleman. Thank you very much. This is a stalwart in terms of public service because it's not easy to stay in the one place in the same institution for some, not even for five to ten years. But honorable members, honorable premier, he stayed here for 35 years. So he was saying to me because um, we talk from time to time, he said to me, uh, Mr. Speaker, don't forget, we need to have that meeting one on one because I, I've been here too long now. So uh, we're going to have that meeting, uh, Mr. F uh, Mr. Brida. I've asked my office to uh, activate that. So you don't need to make appointment, just walk there to see the speaker. I think you've got that authority given your years of service. Uh, Honourable members, in terms of our program, in terms of uh, the order of the day, um, we're going to have the interpolations, questions, and also we do have uh, questions without notice to the Premier, and then member statements, and then motions, uh, which we will end with the report from the Conduct Committee, which this House will consider. Uh, in terms of the interpolations, there's only one. It's an interpolation by the Honourable, the Leader of the Opposition, to the Honourable Minister of Local Government, Environmental Affairs and Development Planning. I now recognize the Honorable Minister Pridan. Thank you, Honorable, Dep Honorable Speaker, and thank you to the Honorable Member for asking me the interpolation. Section 106 of the Municipal Systems Act 2000 requires me as the provincial minister responsible for local government to initiate a provincial investigation in respect of a municipality in the Western Cape where one, I have reason to believe that the municipality cannot or does not fulfill its statutory obligations binding on that municipality or that maladministration, fraud, corruption, or any other serious malpractice has occurred or is occurring in that municipality. And two, I consider such an investigation necessary. A provincial investigation in terms of Section 106 of the Systems Act must be preceded by a pre-investigation -investig assessment <clears throat> as required in terms of Section 5 of the Western Cape Government Monitoring and Support Municipal Act 2014. As part of the pre-investigation assessment, I am required <clears throat> against other things to provide the municipality in question with an opportunity to provide written representation on any allegations that are being considered for a possible investigation in terms of 106 of Systems Act and to then objectively assess all available information before taking a decision on the necessity of provincial investigation. Any action taken <coughs> to investigate allegations must furthermore be procedurally sound and defensible and requires substantiated evidence or documentation to support the allegations. I have received allegations relating to the following. Corruption between city contractors and city officials. Fraud by city contractors who have allegedly inflated invoices, tender manipul manip manipulation by city officials, money laundering by ward councillors. I've commenced with <clears throat> the following 
um, the, the statutory prescribed processes applicable to the assessment of these allegations. To date, the city has been responsive to my request for the relevant information and documentation relating to the various allegations and assessments are currently underway. It should also be noted that the city of Cape Town are equipped with their own internal fraud unit, which undertake their own investigations and report back to appropriate structures on the status of ongoing investigations. The provisions for a provincial investigation in a municipality are in addition to the monitoring and support function of the Western Cape government discharged in the ordinary course of an ongoing basis in accordance with the constitution read with the applicable legislation. In this regard, the Department of Local Government together with the assistance <coughs> exercise and in exercise and information provided by a number of other departments in the Western Cape government, including the provincial treasury, objectively assessed the status of the challenges facing municipalities within the Western Cape on an ongoing basis with a view to ensure that the most appropriate and effective solutions are identified, developed and applied to capacitate and support municipalities. My department provides oversight and support to municipal public accounts committees to all municipalities within the Western Cape province. Impacts are monitored on an ongoing basis and serves as an oversight vehicle for municipalities in respect of fruitless, wasteful, irregular and unauthorized expenditure as well as annual reports and issues raised by the Auditor General. In addition, my department supports all municipalities within the Western Cape with the implementation of the local government anti-corruption strategy and integrity management Honourable framework. All municipalities... Honourable Minister, will you please wrap up? Um, I will stick to that and then we can continue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank speak. you, Minister. Um, Honourable Members, I now recognise the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, speak. Speaker, in 2016, the African National Congress won one municipality, which was Langsburg. As we speak, there are nine municipalities which are either run um, by the ANC through a majority or through coalition. So that means that over the last period, through by-elections, through disillusionment with the DA, 30% of those municipalities are now um, run by the ANC. I think this speaker is creating panic. So the question that we are facing today, after whatever MEC Bridell, Honorable Bridell, said in his four minutes, what it actually came down to is that there has never been a Section 106 investigation into the city of Cape Town. He fails, and I, and I hope that he would, res, uh, in his response, indicate to us what are the time frames. We've got no issue through the speaker to MEC Bridell with the criteria that you outlined. That is correct. That is how it should be. But you failed to mention that in regard to the city of Cape Town fraud, contractual corruption, corruption by officials, um, and many findings. You do not inform this House as to when those interim investigations will be concluded and on what basis a Section 106 investigation will be con conducted or not. So in your response, please indicate. But I think it is this fear of a strengthening ANC that is winning by-elections from the DA that has now resulted in essentially a bias you look at the municipalities in the non-metro, Honourable Speaker, and you see where have Section 106 uh, investigations and how quickly those investigations are actually set up. There is bias. We have a situation where the very chairperson of this standing committee who's going to speak after me refused to discuss detailed evidence raising concerns about the bias of this department and other matters. 
That is shocking. That someone who is supposed to honorable, have oversight. Honorable, the leader of the opposition will you please take your seat. As for a, there's a point of order online. A point of order. Yes. Okay. Um, honorable members, there is a point of order by the honorable the chief whip of the majority party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I was listening quite carefully, and to me, it sounded a lot like uh, the Honourable Doug Moore was casting aspersions on both the minister as well as one of the backbenchers in the House. Um, and uh, as, according to my reading of the rules, um, that's not the way to do so. Thank you. Th thank you, Honourable Chief Whip. That is indeed within the rules. There is no uh, aspersion on the person, but on the it's a political discussion. So the minister will respond in this debate. I will now request the honourable the leader of the opposition to proceed. Um, thank you, uh, Speaker. Your, I just your, asked before us um, your time again. How many more seconds do I have? Your time. You have thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Yes. Is it, Speaker? This works with any DA says not so desperate as the Elik. And they come here with foofies. Because at the end of the day, this is a scandal that Mr. America weigh on getuigenis for the committee to let us This is a scandal. He must say, "Cop hang and scandal," because he should be playing oversight. So it's very clear here. There's no political will to deal because Your either they are scared of the city of Cape Town. Thank you, Honourable Dagmo. Your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Honourable members, I see the hand of the Honourable the Deputy Chief Whip of the Majority Party, Honourable Bartman. Speaker, previously when Member Dugmore was speaking, he didn't mention a name of one of the chairs and the backbenchers to which he was referring. But the second time around, after the Chief embraced a point of order regarding casting aspersions, he mentioned the name directly. And I wanted to find out whether you could please rule whether he is casting aspersions upon a backbencher in this house. Backbencher. Uh, Honorable Batman, I <laughs> find it difficult to to deal with the matter on the basis of what the Honorable, the leader of the opposition, uh, the opposition has said. But do you, do you want to be specific on what rule he violated? <laughs> apologies, apologies, speaker. I'm trying to unmute. May I go ahead? Please go ahead, uh, one of the partner. There is currently a point of order, and there is no point of order on a point of order. Apologies, Speaker. I'm Thanks. trying to unmute, and every time I'm trying to unmute, it just keeps on showing that I'm muted again. Now we can hear you. Will you please proceed, Honorable Bartman? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Chair. Speaker, I wanted to find out whether in terms of the rules of debate, um, in terms of rules, 59 reflection upon members of the house whether that was in order what the member dagmo said thank you honorable partman what, what i've indicated in terms of my previous ruling on the same matter on the point of order raised by the chief whip the Honourable Chief Whip of the Majority Party, is that there was no uh, basis for me to rule uh, any role to any wrong wrongdoing on the side on the part of the Honourable Honourable Dagmo in this regard, and therefore your point of order does not stand. In this case, we proceed. Um, I will not be entertaining any points of order in this specific matter. But we will proceed with Honourable America. Thank you, Honourable America. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> um, Speaker Honourable Dagmo should receive another crash course on oversight. 
despite him being one of the longest serving members of this house. Speaker, I am perplexed by the audacity and hypocrisy of Honorable Dagmar's comments. In the past, he has bragged about how MECs in ANC run provinces have always cooperated with respect to questions concerning municipalities. If Member Dagmar cared about facts, you would see that ANC MSCs share the same sentiments as Minister Bridal. Some have gone a step further and have written to their respective speakers to ask that an array of municipal questions be removed from the question paper. In fact, some ANC MSCs simply ignored questions. Secondly, if Member Dagmo wants to talk about dirty hands at municipalities, then he must remember that the President of Maposa sent the SIU to investigate ANC municipalities in the Western Cape. They are the dirtiest of hands. A further sign of hypocrisy is the ANC talking about corruption. And yet, no ANC member attended the Standing Committee briefing on interventions into their municipalities in the Western Cape. Currently, the department is involved in litigation against Kanaland for the illegal decisions made in council, and they are back to basic support programs being put in place for Lanesburg. On Monday, Minister Mania star stated that his department has decided to place both at West and the parcel administration, owing to the crippling financial situation. Could the Minister, uh, Speaker, please indicate what his inputs are regarding this problematic municipality? I thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Members. The Honourable Members in the Chamber, will you please uh, exercise some restraint? Thank you. Uh, Honourable Member uh, America, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Honourable Members, I now recognise the Honourable Member Makamba Boya. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, Thank you to the minister. Uh, every time when the provincial minister of local government in the Western Cape is approached with matters concerning municipalities in the province, he's always quick to reply, emphasizing the aspects that municipalities have their own autonomy to determine their own processes as provided by the constitution. What he always omits is that chapter three of the constitution of South Africa demands all the three spheres of the government to cooperate with one another in mutual trust and good faith by assisting and supporting one another. So how is it possible that a provincial government department which exercises oversight over municipalities cannot intervene and assist municipalities battling with corruption that has even become public knowledge? Every cent that is stolen and mismanaged in our municipalities results in poor communities being denied access to basic services and the ability to them for them to exercise their rights properly. The reports at issue at the issues of the, the list of the city of Cape Town as being amongst a number of municipalities in the country who saw an increase of 50% corruption complaints by the whistleblowers. The city is also listed as third when it comes to the number of corruption reporting related to the office of the municipal manager. Now, uh, in the light of this report at issues and the allegations contained thereof, what has the department done to assist the city of Cape Town investigate or to get to the root of these corrupt uh, allegations and report those in the, the, in the wrong to the relevant authorities? Thank you, Somlo. Thank you, Honorable Makamba Boja. Uh, Honorable members, I now recognize the Honorable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much once again, Speaker. Speaker, it's very clear that the Democratic Alliance is losing ground in this province. The ANC is now leading 10, close to 10 municipalities, in fact, nine. A tenth one can be taken tomorrow. Why is this? This is because the DA is an elitist party that doesn't care about service delivery in the in, in the chair. Order, on a point of order, order I thought order, you ruled members. that there's no interjections and there's order, howling order. from the side. Please there's proceed. howling. Please proceed. Please proceed. Please proceed. 
honorable members, please, I'm calling on the House, especially the members in the chamber on my right hand side, please do not make the work, the job of the presiding officer difficult. I've uh, muted, I've um, put a pause on your time, Honorable Dagmo. So you may proceed, you just, you just use 28 minutes of your time that is giving you more time. I see there is a point of order from the Honourable the Premier. Uh, what is your point of order, Honourable Premier? Thank you, Speaker. I would like to ask uh, on a point of, well, I want to say clarity. Am I allowed to ask a question of the uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, during an interpolation? You are allowed to honour the Premier. It's a debate if the Honourable Member so wishes to grant the permission to do so. Honourable the Leader of the Opposition, are you willing to take a question? No. Um, speaker, on my timer, when I was rudely interrupted, it was 44 yes, seconds. So I presume I'm going to start at 30 seconds. In so terms of, there's no uh, way that I can accept a question from the Premier, but we can go outside taking a after question? this no. and sort okay. it out. If he wants okay. to come outside with me, we'll go outside okay. and uh, well, at our meeting tomorrow. Well, Honourable, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Honourable Premier, <laughs> it's clear it's not okay. Do you need back benches to go with yeah. you? So the is near. You, you may proceed, Honourable the Leader. <laughs> so, I don't think, Speaker, that the Honourable America should be surprised to find himself the subject of a court case of a high court application, which is going to test fundamentally whether a chairperson of a committee is allowed to suppress discussion, which is in fact about accountability, because that is what he's done. It's a scandal. So don't be surprised if, a, if, if the Honourable America loses that case. I hope you, Speaker, don't join that application. And I hope he, he bears the costs of such an application, because through you, the Premier, he has refused for over a year. He has refused for over a year to discuss a dossier which was presented to him. Let's talk about Kanlan. I want to put it on record. We as the ANC do not support the illegal appointment of the current acting MM. We do not support that and we will oppose it. That we have a situation there which all parties need to deal with in the interest of the people of Kanlan. I put on record, we do not support that appointment. Secondly, in Beaufort West, I'm not sure that the honorable members of the DA should talk about Beaufort West because da gaan a bombas, da gaan a bombas more or a raadslid van die DA wat heeltemal corrupt is. Totally corrupt. And that bomb is going to burst tomorrow. There's a process of actually working with provincial, national treasury and other officials to put an economic recovery and a financial recovery plan in Beaufort West, and we are supporting that. It's very strange that the MEC mentions that the city of Cape Town have got an SIU. What nonsense is this? There's only one SIU. They call themselves a SIU, but this is the very city of Cape Town SIU that has refused to report into serious allegations of corruption into the city of Cape Town Housing Maintenance Department. Why has that SIU and possibly the MEC, the so-called city SIU, La Praat Groot Name, Mara Dunux, they've kept that report under wraps. That is about officials accepting bribes, giving, getting, receiving cars from contractors. Don't, we don't want the MEC to come with platitudes here. We want a time frame from the M MEC about this particular uh, about this particular matter. That is what we want because, in essence, what we see here is a DA losing support. We're not condoning any acts of corruption from wherever they. But the basic problem is the DA doesn't serve the poor. That is why civic associations, other organisations are joining with the ANC because they want to focus on service delivery. That Thank is what you. is happening, and this will come up Thank you, Your Thank you, Honourable Dagmo. Honourable members, thank you. That is the end of your address, Honourable Dagmo. I now recognise the Honourable Minister. Honourable Speaker, to the Honourable Member of the EFF, Bakamba Botia. Um, my department concluded the following initiative in the city of Cape Town as part of our oversight and support role 
um, the rollout of the impact guide and toolkit to the city of Cape Town to improve oversight and good governance, done in conjunction with SALGA, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs and Provincial Treasury, as well as the rollout of local government anti-corruption strategy integrity management framework done in conjunction with the National Treasury Department of COCTA as well as SALGA at the Provincial Treasury. We do that and you started off by acknowledging we three spheres of government. We don't interfere um, and just intervene. We assist and first try to help and support the municipalities. The achbare dark mode is very ironic that the ANC less will be here from corruption. This is rare where all unbekend a party that this land on its knees has against corruption, and they are in fear of it. On the achtbare dag, we must remember, it's not how many rates you rule, it's how you rule. We can read it and we can see what the evidence says. What is the price for Eskom in this province? What is the price? As we see now, and it's not an interference in Beaufort, it's a support package that we want to support Beaufort West. We even pull in national to come and support them with a turnaround strategy. But so is what the Achtbare Dakwa now has said in Canada. Can they ask him leader to ignore him Beaufort West and then we're going to go back to the Achtbare Speaker? Because he gives the power of leadership. He was last by the Congress in 2015. He can't even have a party to steer and he wants to give us a lesson. Achtbare is... De, as achtbare speaker, ons het hoeveel keer gevra, as ons corruptie wil aanspreek, kom ons kapaciteer die hoogs. Let's build capacity within the hoogs. Let's build capacity within the public protectors office. Dit is baie ironies dat die ANC staan nie in preek, maar hulle gaan op een nationale begroting en snij die hoogse begroting met 400 miljoen. Nou wil hulle afkamstig heilig spreek. Dit is een skande in die oor van die publiek. Dit is wel onbekend dat die ANC is een beleid is, hoe armere mense, hoe meer mense sal vir hulle steen. Hulle denk hulle kan mense braai met die 350 rand een maand. Dit is een skande. Dit is een skande waarvoor hulle baie dierprys sal betaal. So die achtbare dag Kom meneer, kom breek, oor hoeveel raaikies hulle bestuur nie, achtbare speaker. Daar die rade is vat van corruptie, hy kan hulle nie beheer nie, sy partij kan hulle nie beheer nie, want dit is totale chaos op grondvlak. So, die laaste wie vir ons een les moet probeer gee, is die ANC. Ons het toe pas 27 audits wat skoon en ongekwalificeerd is, die drie rade wat daar buiten val, is al drie ANC beheer. Dit sê ook een story. Baie dankie, achtbare speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Members, that concludes the debate on the interpolation. And now we move to Speaker, the questions. Point of order. What is the point of order, Honorable Dagmar? Um, no, thank you, Speaker. I noticed that when the MEC had his first um, opportunity to speak, that he didn't um, manage to finish. Is it possible to ask through you, Chair, that the MEC can give us his full initial response in writing, what he was yes. going to say? The, that, that is, that is uh, standard. If the Honourable Minister did not finish, he can provide it to the member who asked the question. Uh, minister, will you provide the response? It will be provided. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Now, order, honourable members, be question number. <laughs> uh, I, I see the honourable members miss the chamber. Uh, I'm glad. Which we, it's clear that next time we're going to have a full house. <laughs> uh, I, I call them. I called them to order. The, the honourable members were connected virtually. They will not pay testimony to this, but I can tell I can tell you, honourable Badmo, honourable Dagmo, that the chairs next to, if they had eyes, they would confirm that. <laughs> but it is true that I've did I've done my very best um, here. Honourable members, let us move swiftly to the questions for oral reply. The, we all know the standard practice. For those honourable members who wishes to, who wish to ask for apps, they will do so after the intention to do so by the first, by the member who asked the question first. I now recognise the 
Honorable Minister of Education, uh, the question was asked by the Honorable Member Syed. Thank you very much, Speaker, and to the member for the question. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, the WCED is applying a strategy that gathers information on the need for teachers in all subjects, which provides the necessary data that we need, including for maths and science. In addition, for the further education and training phase, the department conducted a survey in April this year, during which districts indicated shortages in qualified mathematics and physical science teachers. At the time, for grades 10 to 12, there were 15 teachers needed in mathematics and 11 in physical science. And these shortages are addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I've got the chair of the standing committee. Uh, and then followed by the, uh, okay, Honorable Said, is he represented by yourself, Honorable Dagmo? All right, I will recognize Honorable Said, Honorable Members, followed by Honorable Porter in that order. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, <clears throat> Speaker. Um, I would like to ask the MEC that whether she would agree that in the way that she has answered the, the question, in a typically evasive way, without giving any detail, whether she is aware that that type of conduct from her has resulted in a huge mass disillusionment with her performance in regard to education in general and in regard to maths and science in particular, so much so that members of her own party are agitating that she be removed. She, does she, is she aware that she's become known as the give us money MEC, but uh, MEC who doesn't look for solutions when even she had money which could have been used for maths and science, which was given back to the treasury. She has still failed to place learners. As we speak, they are overcrowded. So in regard to maths and science, you I would like to ask, question, does Dadmore? her response indicate why she has got this reputation in this province because she's actually destroying education in this province? Point Thank you. I would like to request Honorable Dagmo that and, on, and all the other Honorable Members, when you ask a question, you don't enter into a debate. You've done more of a debate than asking the question. And I don't want to create a culture where we get accustomed to that conduct. May I request the, the honourable member in the House, the Minister Michelle, who's got a point of order. Um, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I am rising on Rule 59.1, um, where again, Honourable Dagmo is reflecting on the integrity and dignity of an honourable member of this House, that um, the, the direct aspersions cost on the Honourable Minister is a direct, according to my view, uh, a, uh, uh, um, on the, um, uh, is going against the rules of, of, of the standing rules of Parliament. I want you to rule on it, please. According to your view. Th thank you, Honourable Mitchell. Um, Honourable Members, I'm going to request there's another point of order by the Honourable the Chief Whip, she's online, the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Honourable Dagmore is asking for an opinion, which is uh, not uh, not permitted by uh, the rules of this House. I therefore ask that you ask that you'd rule his question out of order. Thank you, Honourable Chief Whip. Honourable Members, I'm just going to do the following. I'm going to rule section 59, subsection 1 and subsection 2. But more, more particular, the subsection 59, uh, subsection 1, A, B, and C, which says, no member may impute improper motives on or reflect on the integrity or, or, in, or the dignity of or the or verbally abuse another member. Um, then subsection two, a member who wishes to bring any improper or unethical conduct on the part of another member to the attention of the house may do so 
only by way of a substantive motion comprising of uh, clearly formulated and properly substantiated allegations. What the Honorable Doug Moore has done is to make a political statement. He did not call for this House to remove the minister or for the Premier to remove the minister, not, she, not did he call the minister anything other than referring to what is now before us a political debate. So it's, it's making it difficult if you were to sit where I'm sitting. It makes it extremely difficult um, to make a determination uh, and satisfy everyone. So what I am going to do to rule on the basis of the standing rules that we have before us, Honorable Mitchell and the Honorable, the Chief Whip of the Majority Party, I'm going to refer on handset and to see exactly how the presiding officer should be dealing with this matter. And I will do so uh, in the next um, uh, closer opportunity. Um, I do hope that we uh, we make progress in this area because it is raised now for the second time in the same sitting. And for that matter, I do intend to keep the decorum of this house consistent with the standing rules. Now let us move. Um, now may I request the Honourable Minister to respond. The, there is another hand in the uh, online platform, uh, Honourable Mackenzie. Um, if it is on this matter, which I don't want to preempt, but if it does, I've already made a determination, unless you want to speak. So the hand is for contribution in the question itself. Uh, speaker, I just had a point of order on another matter that you previously ruled on, please. Is it is does your point of order still stand, Honourable Yes, McKenzie? please. Yes, please. I'd like to raise it now. Yes. Speaker, you, you previously proceed. ruled on people interjecting from the platform, and Honourable Moran has now twice done it. Uh, um, he's done it actually while you're busy making a ruling uh, on the quoting member, uh, Honourable Minister Mitchell, and I just like you just to be aware of it in case that you didn't hear it. It's not the second time it's done it during the sitting. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mackenzie. I will monitor that. I have certainly made a, a strong statement in this area, uh, specifically to the Honorable Member in question, and I wish that um, this comes to an end, but I am going to look into it. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Mackenzie. I now recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thanks very much, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the Leader of the Opposition. I must say, if that's the best you've got to offer, then I think we are in a really good place in the upcoming elections. Um, do I agree? Um, as a fellow lawyer, I would have thought that the Honourable Dugmore could have noticed that the question said, did my department conduct a needs analysis? And I answered, yes, we did, and I told him exactly how. So if that is uh, answering in an evasive manner, um, I, I don't quite understand that. Uh, he clearly wasn't listening to the answer. Um, do I know all the other issues? No, I don't. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of methods in our party that if people really want to remove me, they can do so at any point in time. And uh, the reason we are all Always asking for money is because the ANC stolen all of it at the national level, which is filtering down to the provinces all the time. And it's making it extremely difficult for us uh, in education to continue delivering the excellent service we do continue to deliver in the Western Cape with ever increasing demands, with people running away from the ANC governed Eastern Cape because they know they can't get a proper education there, but they can here. Uh, so if people mo uh, know me as asking for money, I'm very happy about that because if you can't, as you would know, as a former MEC uh, for a brief while, uh, that you cannot deliver education outcomes without money. And when you have uh, more and more people coming to the province and less and less money in real terms every year because of the ANC's complete and utter mismanagement of this country's economy and our finances, then then it's going to be a free frame that you're going to continue hearing as long as I'm in this office. Thank you, Speaker. The, thank you, Honourable Minister. I now recognise Honourable Bota. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I'm following up on the money. And uh, Minister, did the department receive an increase in math and science conditional grant funding since 2017 up until now in its annual budget with um, the particular reference to the current financial year? Thanks, Speaker. 
Thank you, Honorable Water, um, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to Member Bertha for the, for the question. Um, our allocation for the MST conditional grant increased year on year from 2019, except for the revised allocation in 2020-21 because of the school closures as a result of COVID. Uh, in 2019-20, the allocation was 34.4 million rand, which has risen to 36.3 million for the current financial year. Uh, in terms of supporting teaching, the grant is directed towards teacher training rather than the employment of subject-specific educators. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Minister, uh, Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. I thank you, Speaker. Um, as a follow-up question, I would like to ask um, whether the MEC, given the importance of specialist mathematics and science teachers, particularly at primary school level, um, could give us an indication of to what extent the needs analysis is indicating that we in fact may need to acquire the services of teachers from other countries, given for instance, the valuable contribution that Zimbabwean teachers are making. Does the analysis point uh, to the need to possibly import additional teachers, particularly for primary school um, learners who need these subjects, and whether she um, can indicate to us when the needs analysis that she has indicated has been concluded, um, not only into mathematics and science teachers, but in fact all subjects. When would that be made available uh, to this House uh, through the Standing Committee or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dagmar, the Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I, as I mentioned in my resp response the first time, we uh, do an ongoing analysis, uh, but the, we did a survey particularly in April this year, which indicated shortages which have since been addressed. Um, as far as uh, importing skills, we, we are always in need of maths and science skills, uh, as well as many other subjects. Um, but we, we don't really mind where they come from. We agree that there are many uh, people from other countries like Zimbabwe who can make a, a very uh, good contribution. Unfortunately, the ANC has put measures in place to make it extremely difficult for them to be able to get work permits in South Africa. And in fact, it's national policy uh, to only allow them in exceptional circumstances, which we find most unfortunate. Unfor uh, of course, that doesn't apply to Cubans who seem to get special access to our country whenever the ANC wishes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Minister. I recognise Honourable Bota. Thank you very much, um, Speaker. Um, speaker, through you to the Minister. Minister, um, do you believe that the temporarily uh, employing Cuban specialists would be a sustainable means of improving maths and science teaching? Thanks, Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Bota. I recognise the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you, Member Boeta. No, of course I don't. Uh, we have our own excellent specialists in South Africa uh, employed in our province as well in the Western Cape to train our teachers. Uh, we also have our own uh, teacher uh, training and leadership institute whereby we can do so. So importing temporarily specialists at our cost uh, through a national government agreement who then leave the country taking their skills and support with them doesn't make sense at all. Um, and as I said earlier, we also have concerns about why, why Cubans seem to enjoy preferential treatment when, in fact, uh, there are people in our neighbouring countries who find it extremely difficult to get work permits. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, that concludes questions. Um, that concludes question number one. I now move to question number two by Honourable Mkondlo to the Honourable the Minister of Finance and Economic Opportunities, the Honourable Minister Menier. I recognise you, sir. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the uh, question. We are very proud of the success of our partnership with the Honour, private Honourable sector. Minister. May I draw your attention to your volume on your microphone? It's soft. I wanted to just confirm, am I audible? 
Yes, you are much better now. You may proceed, Honourable Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for drawing my attention to that. We are very proud of the success of our partnership with the private sector uh, through the Pick and Pay uh, Market Store program. Since starting the program in 2017, we have helped to open eight market stores across the Western Cape. Prior to the market store conversion, 24 people were employed uh, in the respective uh, shops, and currently uh, those shops employ uh, 177 people. Importantly, alongside the increase in employment, the program has also increased the cumulative turnover of these stores by more than 6 million from about 1.15 million to 7.87 million. The success uh, is, of course, first and foremost uh, due to the model. Uh, the sites and the entrepreneurs are identified by pick and pay while uh, we assist in unblocking any obstacles and where applicable, for example, access uh, to land in townships. In addition, uh, we provide a grant funding towards the renovation and conversion costs of these stores while pick and pay contributes uh, grant funding, which also includes point of sale equipment, trolleys, uniforms, opening stock, etc. And the balance of the funding, of course, is sourced from uh, development loan uh, funders facilitated by Pick and Pay. The partnership uh, importantly uh, provides uh, independent traders access to Pick and Pay's distribution channel, business systems, and management mentorship. But the program is unique in that all the market stores remain 100% uh, independent. The stores, of course, are fitted with new refrigeration and IT systems and stock uh, and uh, edible and non-edible groceries uh, and, of course, uh, services like money transfers, ticketing, airtime, data, bill payments are all assisted. It's important that each uh, staff complement also receives expert training in IT systems, customer service, retail sk and retailing skills. And, of course, once the stores are up and running, there is also ongoing training and mentorship provided to owners uh, and pick and pay uh, by pick and pay who work closely with store owners on any challenges that they may face. However, despite uh, our best efforts and the best efforts of pick and pay since the start of the program, one store was uh, unfortunately closed. The decision was not reached lightly and followed numerous attempts uh, at intervention by pick and pay but ultimately uh, the store was closed. And I think it's important uh, to note that prior to reaching this point, Pick and Pay uh, assigned two managers to the store to assist the owner in turning around the store to ensure its sustainable, uh, sustainability. The management's, uh, managers had several recommendations to assist the owner in the operations and management of the store. The Department of Economic Development also reached out to the store owner on several occasions to discuss uh, possible ways that uh, we could uh, uh, assist. Of course, this is an unfortunate uh, outcome, but the track record of the program shows that this is the exception rather than rule. And it's clear evidence that this initiative is creating jobs, is supporting skills and development and providing opportunities to entrepreneurs in our township. And this project is a great example of how the public and private sector are working together to grow small businesses and, of course, create uh, jobs, especially in the township economy in the Western Cape. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. I recognize uh, Honorable Mkondlo immediately after Honorable Mkondlo. Uh, Honorable Murray will follow in that order. And then Honorable Bartman. I recognize the Honorable Mkondlo. Honorable Speaker, firstly, before I ask the question, uh, how many opportunities do I have as the initial question to ask? In terms of the rules, you've got the first opportunity, and if you so wish, you indicate by raising your hand or indicate to the presiding officer now. Thank you. Thank you, Somlom. Uh, Somlom, uh, thanks for the minister uh, for, for the response and, and hoping that the minister would have spent more time 
on the essence of the question than presenting what um, I, I think he decided uh, to speak about what is good about the program, because the question is very pointed. It's asking about those uh, struggling stores, what support has been given to those struggling stores. And I just want to check with the minister whether himself or his department, when last were they there in that store uh, to hear the side of the store owner's uh, view about what has happened uh, beyond what uh, he is saying, which is what Pick and Pay provides him? Thank you, Honorable Contra, uh, the Honorable Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to, to emphasize that uh, both the pick and pay and the department, uh, as I said in the reply, provide uh, ongoing mentorship uh, and training. Uh, but of course, that when the stores uh, get into trouble, the assistance uh, is of course then escalated. And in uh, the, the store which I mentioned, I want to emphasize that uh, pick and pay uh, did intervene. Uh, the two managers were uh, allocated to the store over a considerable period of about uh, six months to assist the, the owner. In addition, uh, DDAT has reached out uh, to uh, the store owner to uh, assist. But I do want to uh, assure the member that uh, it goes beyond this. I've made further inquiries uh, and I am advised that in uh, the case of the store to which I believe she is referring, uh, there are now ongoing discussions between uh, pick and pay and the store owner uh, to settle the outstanding matters. And hopefully those outstanding matters can be settled uh, by the, the end of the week. And certainly uh, to the extent that the department may be able to play a role, uh, we will certainly stand ready to assist to resolve this outstanding matter. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, I now recognise Honourable Murray. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Honourable Minister, I want to speak to you about what you're doing to preserve Cape culture in terms of business. You know, we have for decades, centuries, occupied the uh, Grand Parade, the Salt River Fish Market, all of Elches uh, along the street. They were hawkers selling fruit, vegetables. I can still hear their cries for lack of fish, lack of lamuna, souffle for a rant. It was a happy place until first we started killing them by huge shopping centers where people flocked to and they were driven out of business. Then the supermarket chains, hypermarket chains took over, killed our, our butchers, our off sales, our fruit stalls, our fish markets, they could sell everything. So the small man was destroyed. And now with COVID, the few that was left get no assistance. The hawkers who shout there with bananas or with apples or with fish and oranges, nobody what? cares oh. about them. They're unemployed. What are you doing for them? What okay. are you doing for the small colored hawker, Minister? Thank you, Honourable Murray. May I now request the Honourable Minister to respond? Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. We would obviously want to do everything that we can uh, to, to preserve uh, and support uh, the, the hawkers and traders uh, to which you refer uh, and to maintain what you uh, refer to, uh, I think, very eloquently as those uh, happy places. I'm aware, for example, that the city of Cape Town uh, regard uh, and are reviewing uh, their uh, bylaws 
in order to look at uh, and examine uh, these uh, measures because uh, they recognize just how, uh, in how important uh, informal traders are to our economy, supporting opportunities and providing income uh, to households. I would encourage the member to perhaps put a, a, a detailed uh, written question to me so that I can provide him uh, with a much more comprehensive uh, reply. But certainly, uh, we would want as a department to do everything that we can to support the small businesses, the informal traders uh, who occupy the happy places to which he refers in the Western Cape. Thank you, Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister has correctly dealt with the question. I thought the Honourable Murray was uh, now introducing um, other matters which make it difficult for the member in the executive to respond. And I would like to request the Honourable Members when seeking to do a follow-up, please do so in terms of the original question or by means of following up on the responses by the member of the executive. It makes it easier and it is in line with the standing rules that you are able to hold the executive to account. Otherwise, I you must think, be, I think otherwise, you speak uh, in writing your question uh, to the honorable member. Thank I you, think honorable Thank Marek. you for indulging me. I realize that I perhaps was offline with a question, but I still thank the minister for considering it important enough to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Murray. That is assisting a lot. Thank you. Now, Honourable Members, I recognise the Honourable, uh, the Chair of the Committee, Honourable Bartman. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I want to define out from the Minister, given um, the success of the programme so far throughout the Western Cape, although with the concerns of the one store, obviously, whether there are programs of such a nature that are implemented in other provinces, and if so, if there are any learnings um, from those provinces that the minister could share with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Bartman. Uh, perhaps the minister will be able to respond. Uh, I recognize the Honorable Minister. Honourable Minister. I'm sorry, the speaker, I was on mute. Uh, I did want to, to make the point that the pick and pay market store program, we think has been a resounding success in our province. But I do think it's important to note that it is not only implemented uh, in our province. In fact, the program commenced, uh, if I uh, am correct, in another province in Gauteng. And while the uh, the, the, the intervention uh, is often uh, dismissed uh, by members of the, the opposition in this province. Those reservations uh, do not seem to be shared uh, by the opposition's counterparts who are in government in Gauteng. And in fact, uh, I uh, would like to quote uh, Premier uh, David Makura, who uh, in fact referred to the program, and I quote when he said, that one of the, the great stories, one of the, the great stories in the township economy uh, is uh, how this, and he refers to it as a transformative partnership between, uh, between pick and pay uh, and the Gauteng Enterprise uh, Propeller has supported uh, small businesses by uh, creating uh, market stores uh, in Gauteng. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, I see there's a whole host of hands that have been uh, lifted online. I can, however, indicate that there's only one opportunity left, and I've got, in terms of the lineup, Honourable McKenzie, Honourable Kondo, and Honourable Makamba Pokia, and that then suggests that Honourable McKenzie will go first, and then the rest of the hands are now it is, you know, 
fall away. So I'm so sorry for that, but that's the rules. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and thank you for the earlier response, Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, given that we're dealing obviously with a store in the township and the township economy, what else is the minister and his department doing in the township economy? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mackenzie. I recognize the Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, as it happened, uh, I was invited to speak uh, in the NCOP on exactly this subject uh, yesterday, on building a self-reliant and vibrant uh, township economy. And it was in that debate that I, I made the point that the township uh, economies are a unique focus of our pro approach to uh, small business support. Of course, I uh, traversed the pick and pay market store uh, project, which I've spoken about at length in my reply to the Honorable Nkondra. But that is not our only intervention in the township economy. Yesterday, I referred members of the NCOP to, for example, our Western Cape Entrepreneurship uh, Recognition Awards, which recognize the achievements and potential of the most inspiring entrepreneurs in the Western Cape. And of course, uh, that those awards have specific categories for township businesses, as well as women-owned and youth-owned businesses. And most importantly, they provide recipients not just with prize money, but much more importantly, critical access to business support services, such as financial training and, uh, and mentorship. I also uh, referred members of the, the NCOP to our SMME Booster Fund, uh, where we are supporting small businesses, including small businesses in townships uh, across the, the Western Cape. We have, for example, the ASISA Flame Program, which is providing financial literacy and training and business incubation, business skills training, seed funding and business coaching and mentorship to small businesses in Kailiche, in Guguleti, in Mufuleni and Kaiamandi. Beneficiaries like the Fix Forward, are providing uh, business training workshops, for example, and mentoring uh, uh, to trade contractors in Guguletu and Lange and Philippi. And of course, the South African Education Project uh, is providing training and mentorship uh, and financial management and regulatory compliance advice to 15 early childhood businesses in Mitchell's Plain, in Philippi, and of course, uh, in Philippi East. I went on to talk about the what we had done in the township economy uh, during COVID-19, uh, COVID assisting informal traders and spaza shop owners to access uh, funding, uh, assisting businesses to pivot and adapt uh, to manufacture PPE and provide COVID-19 related services through our COVID-19 supplier development program. And of course, providing COVID-19, 11,000 COVID-19 safety kits to small businesses and informal uh, traders across the 30 municipalities in the Western Cape. I've also talked about our very innovative uh, intervention in the township uh, economy, where the uh, community uh, economic recovery project was supporting local spaza shops through the provision of digital vouchers for food relief and community kitchens. And of course, those digital vouchers were provided to 225 community kitchens, which were then spent at 122 participating spaza shops and injected over 3 million rand into the local uh, township economy in the Western Cape. And of course, I also talked about the work that we are doing to support uh, municipalities, uh, supporting the development, for example, of the Cape Agalis Municipality uh, Trading Hub, the Lanesburg Municipality Trading Hub, and of course, the Squirm Flay uh, Business Hub, all supporting small uh, businesses. And of course, I also drew uh, members' attention to the Kailicha Bandwidth Bond, uh, which is, as members know, a very successful partnership between the city of Cape Town and the province uh, and others right in the heart of Kailicha. And these are just a few of the measures that we are taking to support the township economy in the Western Cape. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, that concludes this particular question. Um, we now move to question number four. Question number three was 
withdrawn and therefore the question at hand now is by Honorable Van der Westeisen to the Honorable Minister of, fin Minister of Agriculture. I now recognize the Honorable Minister Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Honorable Member uh, Van der Westeisen for this uh, question. Uh, the Westkaapse Departement van Landbouw ondersteun veeboere met voer en weens die besperkte beskikbare befondsing ondersteun die departement slechts veeboere wat in kritieke en uiters kritieke gebiede is volgens die departement se jaarlikse veldassesseringskriteria. Twee jaarlikse ramp assesserings word onderneem om onder meer die huidige status van die heersende droogte te bepaal Hier die assessering van die natuurlijke veldtoestande. Die natuurlijke veldtoestande is een goede aanduiding om gebiede wat nog steeds uh, door droogte geteister is. Uh, so ons gebruik daar die veldassessering als die maatstaf om te bepaal wat er uh, gebiede uh, droogte op moet kry. Die meest onlangse jaarlijkse assessering is vanaf 2 tot 5 maart 2021 uitgevoer en hierdie evaluering sê bevestig dat die hele Centraal Karoo dele van die tuinroute, Overberg en noordelike ge gebiede van die Westkus distrik steeds in die greep van een erge droogte is. Die hoeveelheid steen wat aan boere verleen word is gebaseer op die aantal groot vier eenhede op elke plaas. Elke aanzoek wordt op distrik en op hoofkantoorsvlak uh, beoordeel en geëvalueer. Elke kwalificerende boer ontvangt dan ook uh, voerbewijs vir vier wat afgelost kan worden bij die naaste coöperatie, wat dan op die databasis van die project bestuursidentiteit geregistreerd is en die departement volgt elke bewijs vanaf die tijd dat het aan die boeren uitbetaal is, totdat die coöperatie betaal is, so ons werk via die plaaslijke coöperaties, wat dan op ons databasis geregistreerd is. Die departement volgt dan ook dan die standaard bedrijfsprocedure vir droogtevoer, wat dan een rechtvaardige aankoopproces verseker vir alle boeren wat in uiters kritieke of selfs kritiek droog gebiede gelees. Achtbare speaker, tot op hierde, het hierdie kritieke en uiters kritieke gebiede kort termijn voerverlichting ontvang, maar moet verdere voerverlichting ook voorzien word, uh, ander beoordeling wat in september 2021 gedoen word, om die toestand van die veld vast te stel, en op grond van die veld herstel, sal die ondersteuning dan aan die boere teen ooreenkomstig aangepas word. Die implicatie daarvan is dat zekere gebiede het intussen ook goeie reent ontvang en daarom moet daar ook weer een herevaluering gedoen ten einde die nodige uh, boere ondersteuning dien oor een komstig aan te pas. So, baie dankie, achtbare speaker. Thank you, honorable minister. Honorable members, I recognize the honorable van der Westeisen ahead of doing that. We have the Honorable Marais and uh, Honorable Maran as the next speakers. I recognize you, Honorable Van der Westeise. Achtbare speaker, dear Ian Minister Meyer, alle voorspellings is dat die huidige goeie reenvaljaar voor en toe weer dier erge droogtes gevolg sal word. En ons weet ook dat die beste droogteverlichtingsmateriaal is om genoeg water te stoor in jare soos hierdie, vir daar die jare waar die reenval weer onder die gemiddeld sal wees. Nou die minister van openbare werke, mevrouw Patricia de Lul, het vroeger hierdie week die klein William Dam project besoek en weer eens beloof dat ons binnenkort een vordering sal sien in hierdie project wat allemaal weer tot stilstand gekom het. Dit volg op minister Quinties loodsing van die project in 2008, nadat dit de vorige keer ook 
al reeds tot stilstand gekomen. het. So ons sien hierdie soort van beloftes voor elke verkiezing. Ons het ook gezien dat daar verloft, beloftes was vroeger vir jaar van ANC verteenwoordigers, dat daar honderde plaatselijke werksgeleentiere dier hierdie project uh, geskep zou worden. Vooral was hierdie beloftes gemaakt toe die Sederberg municipaliteit verwacht het daar daar een tussenverkiezing sal wees. Nou my vraag dier die speaker aan minister Meijer is, in die licht van die gedrag wat ons tot dusver gezien het, kan u voor ons verzekeren dat u in uw departement niet die positie van desperate, uh, arm en werkloze mensen zal gebruiken, vooral in die droogte tijd en droogte areas, die leer beloftes te maken. En vooral om stemmen te winnen voor die uh, komende municipale verkiezingen. Nie. En dat droogte hulp dier ieder departement aan allemaal beschikbaar gesteld zal worden, wat daarvoor kwalificeer, ongeacht de politieke ondersteuning van uh, die partij. Thank you, Honorable van der Westeze. I now recognize the Honorable Minister. I thank you, Achbare Speaker. En dank je en achtbare lid van de Westeisen. Ons weet dat water is een basisrecht, recht, het is een constitutionele recht en wordt beschermd in die grondwet. En ik denk dat het een grievelijke nalatigheid is om water en watergebruik te misbruiken voor politieke goedkoop doeleindes. En ik kan u voor de zekering geven dat mijn departement zal geen sinds deelnemen aan goedkoop politieke activiteiten niet. En ik zal mijn werk doen binnen die raamwerk van die grondwet, zoals voorgeschreven. Ik kan ook, zoals mijn collega's en ik zelf en jullie wetgever, een amtseed genomen om zeker te maken dat ons doelwitten, onze activiteiten en onze projecten en onze programmen zal voldoen aan die beginsels van billigheid en redelijkheid. Maar sinds die honorable member referred specifically now to the raising of the Clan William Dam. I think this is very important, Honorable uh, Speaker. Just yesterday, I had a meeting with the stakeholders in agriculture, and one of the stakeholder organizations did present uh, to us what they call the drivers for agriculture. And they mentioned four things, energy provision, infrastructure, safety, and water. Now, all of these, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, all of these functions are competence of the national government department. But we are now beyond blaming the national government because energy is ESCOM. Infrastructure is the national department of public works and water affairs. Safety is responsible of the national government. Water is from water and safety affairs. The premiers ask us to apply the principle of resilience. And so working together with the various departments and the municipalities, we will continue to make sure that we deliver what is within our mandate. But it is disappointing that the proposed raising of the Clan William Dam by the department at the time of human settlements and water and sanitation, they will significantly yield, if it is properly managed, 70 million cubic water per annum. And 70% of the additional water is earmarked, uh, Honorable Speaker, for resource, poor uh, farmer development, and the balance to improve the water supply for existing water allocations. Now, raising the Clean William Hall will have significant benefits. The capacity of the dam is being roughly doubled. There will be additional 5,500 hectare of irrigated land, and there will be an additional 3,800 jobs. So if this project is properly managed, everybody can collectively benefit in that particular area. Now, my department uh, is also uh, involved in the studies because we provided valuable input uh, into the bridging study to determine whether the water should be used and the infrastructure required to determine the water uh, to the farm boundaries. For example, we have made five land available, honorable speaker, for Lorva, which is the Lower Olifant River Water Use Association. Uh, we supported them with 5.8 million rand. 
uh, to conduct preventative maintenance. And is anybody now traveling in that particular area? You would have seen there are some preventative maintenance work taking place uh, in the canal. For us, that is very, very important. But I think it is said it should have been completed already, but the incompetence, the bankrupt, mismanaged National Department of Water and Sanitation has caused numerous uh, delays. And, Honorable S Speaker, former Minister in Quinty, since Honorable Member uh, Van der Westhuizen has now referred to former Minister in Quinty, he and former Minister Mokinyana and their successors were complete disasters in the Department of Water and Sanitation. And Minister Lindiwe Susulu was equally not the fit for purpose to manage a critical resource like water. And we know that one of the key drivers of economic growth, specifically in the West Coast region, specifically in the agricultural region there in the area of Matsikama and uh, Citrusdal, is the issue of water security. And it seems to me that the current Minister of Water and Sanitation is missing in action. And that is why the National Minister of Public Works had to go to Glen William during the course of the week. And she went there because the current minister was missing in action. And we know that the current minister uh, of Water and Sanitation, Minister Sensu Mchunu, he has failed to manage the wage bill of the government. And now he's been given another important assignment and that is to manage water and sanitation. And he was again missing in action and the National Minister of Public Works had to go and do oversight over his project. So I am certainly uh, disappointed, but the Premier has taken this matter up with the national government because certainly this is an important matter. My colleague, the Minister of Local Government and Environmental Affairs are in continuous con uh, contact with the National Department in this particular regard, because there are massive spin-offs uh, if this uh, Clint William Dam, the, the wall is raised. So I'm disappointed, but determined, confident that we will be able through our various structures to get this project back on track, even if the Premier has to raise it at the PCC, the President Coordinating Council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honourable members, I now recognise the Honourable Member Murray. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, something in what you said uh, drew my attention. You mentioned uh, that on um, work did plastic cooperations, and then it was we we give it help to those who need it most. Now that is uh, something that needs re-examination. Does all emerging farmers belong to the corporations? Certainly not. So how are they consulted? The corporations is mostly belong to commercial, white commercial farmers. That is a fact. I got nothing against it. But if you only work through those who registered and, and you work through the local cooperatives, it means a small farmer who's not part of the cooperative because he's not into commercial farming yet. What happens to him? And what happens also to the thing of who needed most? Obviously, a farmer with a thousand cattle Compared to a small farmer with only a hundred cattle, who are you going to say who needed most? Who's going to get the most water and the most feed? It's like saying this woman has five big children, the other one only has one child, so the one with the five children needed most, so the other one get nothing almost because you got one child. How are the you going to get? Um, Equitable you distribution of assistance. May I request that you stick to the question? That is the question. All right. Thank to you. To ensure that drought relief is distributed fairly. 
That is the question, Speaker. I ask if it's fairly, if if you must decide between giving a small farmer with 50 cattle and assisting to one with a thousand cattle. Honorable Murray, what I'm saying is that I wanted you to ask the question, but not to uh, enter into a debate at this point. So you have asked the question. I didn't want you to motivate the question. So because that is the rules. And I, I thank you that you have done that. Now the Honorable Minister is ready to respond. Bye, thank you. And Akbar uh, Mare, it was the first question. It's a very relevant question. Uh, meneer Maré, ons uh, gebruik een belangrijkste criteria en dit is die veldassessering. Uh, dit is voor ons belangrijk, ongeacht of u 10 uh, schapen heeft en of u 100 schapen heeft. Dit is voor ons belangrijk dat ons kijkt naar die veldcondities en ook baie belangrijk, ons kijkt ook naar die veld, die grootte van die veld en die draagkracht van die veld. Met andere woorden, Als ons die veldassessering gedoen het, zal ons dan voor die boer sê, gegeven jou veldomstandigheden, dat is die maximum schapen wat jy kan mag anhou op hierdie terrein, en ons veldassessering zal dan ook bepaal hoeveel uh, hulp jy sal kry ten opzichte van vier voer. Dat baat nie, ons sê vir die boer, dat jou veldassessering is van so aard, dat jy net, 50 schapen mag anhou, en dan kom ons daar, en het jy 1000 schapen. In daar die gevallen, ons penaliseer daar die boere, want hulle mag nie 1000 schapen anhou, as die veldkracht, of soos ons praat, die draagkracht van die veld, net sê 50 schapen kan anhou. Dan sal ons vir die 50 schapen vier voer gee, maar jy moet baie voorzichtig wees, ons gaan nie vir mense 1000 schapen Vier voer geen nie van jou draagkracht. Die veldassessering sê, jy kan net 50 schapen anhou. So dis belangrijk, die draagkracht van die veld, gebaseerd op die veldassessering. Meneer Marie, ek dink die vraag, geldige vraag, want ons moet altyd optree, billik en redelik, en ook teen oor kleinboere. Wanneer die mens by jou koperatie, baie boere gebruik maar die koperatie, Kleinboere, commerciële boere, enige persoon. Die kan ook bij een coöperatie soos jy sal weet instap. Wat ons doen bij die coöperatie, daar word nie gediscrimineer nie. Boere het gewoonlik twee rekeningen. Een, bedrijfsrekening, wat enige of wat enige iets wat hy aankoop vir sy plaas, gaan na die coöperatie en hy koop het op sy eie. Maar wanneer hy droogte hulp krij, meneer Marie, dan koop hy ons vir hom een tweede rekening, by die coöperatie en die rekening sy naam is droogte hulp. Kleinboere kry dan een koopbrief van my departement en op die koopbrief sal daar staan uh, 300 of 400 sakke veevoer. So hy kan nie by die coöperatie kom en besluit jong, wacht, ek lis nou vir het opbranne wie nie. Gaan nie werk nie. As hy by die, by die coöperatie kom, Ons gee hom een brief en hy vaar het vir die coöperatie. Dit word dan, kom ons sê, die boer kry 10.000 of 20.000 randse veevoer hulp. Dan kry hy een brief en hy vaar het, ons het open een speciale rekening by die coöperatie en hy vaar dan die brief na die coöperatie toe en die coöperatie, hy sê vir die coöperatie, man, ek soek so 2.000 randse veevoer. Dan word het van hy 20.000 afgetrek, dan het hy nog 18.000. En so kan hy aangaan, so klein boer, commerciële boer, ongeacht daar, hulle word allemaal op daarie basis gehad. So as geen discriminatie nie, allemaal word baie mooi gehad. Ek was self by klein boere, daar in Amakoland, self gaan kyk, self die veevoer van die bakkie afgeleid, op hulle bakkies, so dit gaan vir ons oor die, uh, die veevoer. So daar word twee rekeninge geopen, om seker te maak, dat daar, en daar word ook, maandeliks reconciliatie gedoen, so dat ons kan weet hoeveel van die klein boere het vier gekoop en my departementse ambtenare gaan ook uit om te kijk op die boere dan ook uh, uh, hoe doen hulle vier, uh, hulle vier punte dat die dierraam gezond is en so voort. So 
daar die program is in werking en dit werk baie oulik en ek denk al die boere verstaan hoe die koopbriefstelsel werk en ek het nog geen klagtes ontvang nie en hier en daar is sommige boere maar stout, maar oor die algemeen het werk dit baie positief en geen discriminatie nie. Die vraag van billigheid en redelijkheid, fairness en reasonableness is applied in the allocation of drought support. I love your grandchild in the background. Uh, oh, she just... Greetings <laughs> to your wife. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Thank you for answering my question Thank and the you, manner Minister. that I expect of you. Honor oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Murray, no, we, we will miss you when you are no longer in this chamber. <laughs> Uh, but that's the privilege of being a veteran. You see, I, I, I have to comply, otherwise I'm in trouble. But thank you, Honorable Mare, uh, Honorable Minister, thank you. We have the last opportunity by Honorable Maran. Uh, given the time limit, I will not take anyone beyond that. It's going to be Honorable Maran and then the Honorable Minister will respond. Thanks, uh, Honorable Speaker. Speaker, I've just heard that the Honorable Van der West Station is planning the success of the ANC within the West Coast region on the Glen William Dam, uh, because since 2016, the West Coast region in specifically is, is question, winning municipalities. What is speaker, your question, Mara? My question is, Speaker, gepraat van the Glen William Dam and the, the droogte, Het die premier in 2019 beloof dat sy regering nie vir een oomblik sal twyfel om, om die provincie se geld te spandeer as het kom by water nie. Uh, die brandvleidam spesifiek. Maar die 20 miljoen rand wat daar was het toe in tussentijd verdwijn, het toe weer verskyn, het toe weer verdwijn. So it's, 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 it's as label of the speaker. Speaker, can this MEC tells us whether it's true that his department except the, the cooperations that you have mentioned, that his department is using third parties uh, to uh, manage and to pay uh, emergency relief, especially when it comes to drought, uh, to, to farmers. And if true, what cut do these consultants take as a commission before even one beneficiary uh, is paid? Thanks. Th thank you. Honorable Maran, I now recognize the Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, and thank you. Good afternoon to my good friend, Man, uh, Honorable Member Maran, and thank you for your concern about the dam and the water security. Yes, I think you would have heard in my answer, you, because your question was also related. Your, your question is multiple angles. One of the angles is, what have we done in terms of our own funding, in terms of water security? As I indicated, uh, very important work that took place recently is in the area of the uh, maintenance on, on the canal through the uh, Lower Olifants uh, River Water User Association, LORVA. Uh, 5.8 million rand was made available. You will also recall that I did announce this in my main budget in the beginning of the year. Yes, I agree, Honourable Member, and thanks for you for raising it again. I think it is important, the issue of the 20 million rand. I was at the time the Minister of Finance where we approved the 20 million rand and due to some uh, uh, issues that was involved with the uh, Department of Water and Sanitation, uh, they have made some promises to me that they will start with the construction work. They have promised me that they have completed the architectural designs. I have personally met a young architect from Bialbal Water Affairs uh, on site at Brandfrey Dam in the uh, uh, area of uh, uh, Breda Valley Municipality together with the mayor of Breda Valley Municipality to personally observe what is the hold up. I was then also informed that this must happen before the rain season, in other words, around about October, that was two years ago. But it seems that there was just one or other continuous stumbling block in this particular regard. Yeah, and I think we are still uh, dealing with that particular matter. I think Honorable Member Maran will also uh, have noticed because he's from that particular area uh, there in the uh, Breda Valley area. He would have uh, appreciated that we have completed and I've recently launched 
a 78 million rand ecological uh, infrastructure project that was uh, destroyed as a result of major floods near the Hoflé in Rosenville. And so that project is now handed over to the Water Use Association so many more water can go into the Brandfle Dam. Yes, so there are some uh, further work that needs to happen in, the, in terms of the context of water security, but I can assure you that my colleague, the Minister of Local Government and Environmental Affairs, is in also in continuous contact with the Department of Water Affairs. I'm in continuous in contact with them through our disaster management uh, and so through our land care program, continuously working, no matter how complex the situation is, no matter how difficult it is, we are trying to make sure that we ensure greater water security. We are very thankful that in the recent past, we had quite a lot of rain and we are expecting record harvest seasons. Our dams, the Minister of Local Government has released a statement recently that our dams are now 101% uh, percent, uh, full of water. So we're very thankful for the good rains, but there are certain parts there where we still need some rain. The, lastly, Honourable Chair, the uh, uh, Honourable Member Maran asked about third parties and consultants. Well, I will have to come back in terms of that particular answer. But what is happening? There's multiple role players involved in drought assessment. Firstly, there is the Provincial Department of Agriculture. There's the National Department of Agriculture. There is the Provincial Disaster Management Centre. There's the National Disaster Management Centre. There's the co-ops. There is the current role players. And we do use the co-ops through uh, a medium through which we channel the funding for drought support. That is certainly the case and everything there is above board. Thank you, uh, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, that concludes the debate on the um, questions. That, con that concludes the replies on the questions and the question itself. And we have also exhausted the time for questions for oral reply. We now move to questions to the Premier without notice. Um, and that is in terms of Rule 204. The Honourable Members that have expressed interest to ask questions to the Premier, it's Honourable Maran, it's Honourable Bota, Honorable Wenger, Honorable Heron, Honorable Makamba Boja, Honorable Van Fochel, and Honorable Christians. I now recognize the Honorable Member Marat. Speaker, uh, thank you. My question is Afrikaans. Uh, speaker, can the Wiskaps Premier for us tell us how I'm so fast to is om the verkopen van drank aan te help en te herstel te mede van een wereldziekte en talle probleme soos een fatale alcoholsyndroom en laar intelligentie, drankmisbreek, wat talle andere evels aanjaag soos gesinsgeweld, mestekerei, ongelukke of allerlei besierings aanjaag waar onafhankelijkheid hoog is uh, en dier om te behandelen. Die gevolgen van die apartheidsdopstelsel is nog zorgbaar en nog met ons en onder meer eeuwige zekerziektes wie ons goedkoop zoet ransoenwijn uh, wat vooral aan plaatsmensen verkoop wordt en zelfs laarschoolkinders drankschool toevat en drank op die school is een geleende jede verkoop kan worden. Dank u. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mara. I now recognize the Honorable Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you very much to the Honourable Moran for that uh, question. I guess by dankbaar that uh, you know uh, op hierdie uh, focus met jou vraag. I think that was a uh, gedeelte van die gesprek last week ook uh, samen die leier van die oppositie. And I guess by blij dat voor al die ANC in die huis uh, hierdie uh, punt uh, vooral opvat. I think that's by by belangrijk. Um, I want to say initially that uh, of course. You know, we we have uh, for years now had a number of uh, interventions and we've uh, gone through a number of processes specifically trying to find that balance in uh, the space of alcohol abuse and, of course, the uh, space where the alcohol 
industry specifically, I think, and uh, where the Honourable Moran also uh, is in support of the rural economy, rural jobs, uh, on farms, specifically the wine industry, etc. And you've got to always uh, be looking at a balance. But of course, part of this question, uh, that is where, uh, what is the gevolge van, uh, misschien ons uh, uh, witskrifte, ons uh, die werk wat ons doen as, uh, as regering om van ons mense te beskerm, as ook uh, dier wetgeving en die wetgeving verandering. And uh, I think, as I said last week, in uh, June already, we signed off as a cabinet for the next phase of an amendment to our liquor bill. Um, and so, of course, we must have a look at how we can use regulation uh, and how we find that balance through regulation on the one side, but also engagement, I think, with, uh, with the industry itself. Uh, I also think that the industry also needs to take a lot more responsibility. I quite often liken... Uh, and especially when we look at the at the systems that we've got in place here, like our trauma system in our hospitals, which we're now rolling out more and more, we're almost at 20 of our hospitals that will have that trauma measurement system where we can actually see the consequences of the abuse of alcohol. Now, I always liken this to the motor vehicle industry to say how many people uh, how, or how the motor vehicle industry take responsibility for the safety of their drivers, their customers, people who utilize their, their product. And then they even come out like uh, manufacturers saying, this is the safest vehicle on the market. And these are what we do about making uh, vehicles safer, et cetera. And we need to also say to the industry, understanding where uh, damage is done, what are we doing about it there? Because it cannot only be around, around regulation, but it also can't only be government and the industry. It's also got to be our citizens. Our citizens, our public reps in this house, everyone has got to be playing a role here um, because it's also about behavior change and about, uh, you know, the, the, the person. Remember, we changed car accidents to car crashes because somebody behind that wheel caused the crash uh, or somebody caused that uh, vehicle to crash and did something that 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 driver had to do something. And there was a crash. So there was a cause. And here with alcohol, there's also a cause, and that is citizens that are not able to uh, utilize this product responsibly. And of course, that results in a whole lot of, of issues. So behavior change is also critical, and that's also a key partner in trying to get this system right. Uh, so speaker, it's about the regulation, it's about the industry, and it's also about citizens. But what does concern me about the question uh, from the honorable member. And uh, I mean, I've been in this house for many years and I've had this debate for many years at one stage. I'm the premier now, I do have a responsibility. But I also had the key responsibility when the liquor authority vested with me uh, as uh, the MEC responsible then. And time after time after time, I get this response that I heard today in the question about the Dobstels. And I really want to say, and I'm sure I've said to the honorable Moran before, please, Number one, can you give me the detail? But I presume the detail that you're going to give me is going to be a docket number or a charge number because it is illegal. And if you have got, and, and especially as a member of this house, if you have got information that there's a dope stelsel system running here and you haven't laid that charge, you are just as culpable. So don't make the statement here without backing it up. You need to please lay that charge with the police. Give me the information. We'll follow it up. We'll make sure that we find uh, convictions because it is absolutely illegal. And please, I want to make sure. I will sicker mark Achbala lit that I hierdie boodskap moet duidelik krijgen. As jy in hierdie informatie het, as a blief, ek soek die klagstaar. We must lay this charge. It is illegal. I want to say the same thing around law school kinders wat drank misbruik. That is also absolutely illegal. If you are aware of it, please, we need to know the school, the, the children, where they go to school, where they live, etc. Let's have a look at that. Of course, this is even more complex than the first case you mentioned, but we need to go in and have a look. We need to get social development involved. involved. We can lay charges against parents, 
Uh, we need to make sure that we deal with this. So if you've got information on both of these issues that you've raised, please, I would expect to get that information, names, places, times, and also at the same time, the, uh, the charges that you have laid specifically because you are aware of this illegal activity. By Nanki Speaker. Thank you, Honorable mm -hmm. Premier. I now give an opportunity for a first follow-up uh, to Honorable Maran, if you so wish. Speaker, yeah. Uh, baie dankie uh, om te luister as a skill. Uh, wat ek gesê het is die gevolge van die apartheid dopstelsel wat nog steeds sakbaar is op ons gemeenskappe. Ek hoop die, ek antwoord die, die, die premier in termen van die hyene. Uh, speaker, tweede vraag, kan die, speaker, kan die speaker vir ons bijvoorbeeld uh, en ek gepraat van finding the balance between uh, saving livelihoods and saving lives. Kan die premier vir ons sê of wel by a hospital sy noodafdeling was en gesien het hoe levens van slagoffers van drang geweld met moeite gered word terwijl dit een groot las op, op die staatskas van die provincie is. Dank u. Thank you, Honorable Mara. I recognize the Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you very much for the follow-up, Honorable Member. I think, first of all, uh, yes, maybe just your, your point on uh, that first follow-up. And, of course, uh, I think one of the biggest consequences is fetal alcohol syndrome. It is a massive problem in our province, also in our country. And, again, that is uh, an area that we need to be continually focusing on. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome sets up a young person to fail in the future. Um, when that child is born, we know that that child is uh, disadvantaged from the get-go because fetal alcohol syndrome has uh, severe consequences from a from a brain damage point of view. And of course, that's why we, we and it's very difficult because how do you know when someone is pregnant? And, uh, you know, you actually want that responsibility to be held by the citizen, uh, that individual uh, pregnant mother to be able to know that they are pregnant and they are not going to drink excessively. They're not going to drink, actually. We should uh, make sure that that happens, uh, that uh, moms to be do not uh, take alcohol during their pregnancy because they do disadvantage the child. That is just one. I mean, there are a whole lot of them. Absolutely, and I agree with the with the honourable member. Then, with regard to his question on whether I've been to these units, uh, absolutely, and exactly in the last month, I've visited uh, Mitchell's Plain, Kyle Leacher, Drakenstein uh, Hospital, and um, where else was I? Coming up the west coast, I visited a hospital. I, but I I've been visiting hospitals wherever I go. I visit a hospital when I when I go, um, and specifically. Uh, the questions are asked not are necessarily about COVID-19, uh, although that is the main issue that most of our hospitals are dealing with, and to engage with the frontline workers and thank them. But I always focus on two other things. Uh, the one is trauma, which is what the Honourable Member speaks about. I'll come back to that. And then, of course, it's also about mental uh, well-being. I also make sure that we ask questions about mental well-being. And maybe I can say here to the members of this House, when it comes to a question that we're busy dealing with at the moment around uh, who gets dropped off at our hospitals when it comes to our psych wards. Uh, they are totally overburdened. We know that mental wellness is a big issue in our province at the moment, but our psych wards are also being abused by the policing system where um, it's much easier to drop off someone who is perhaps uh, on drugs or perhaps uh, inebriated. They are a criminal. They are known. Uh, they're probably a multiple offender. And instead of doing the paperwork, you drop them off at the hospital for observation. And we've got to look at these kind of issues. And that's what helps when you go and visit yourself, because, of course, the health department themselves are also busy dealing with all of, uh, of these issues. But on the question of uh, our trauma, I mean, we are the only province in South Africa that measures that trauma that he speaks about in our hospitals. Um, we measure it and we measure it. Uh, according to all cases of trauma, but obviously if there's alcohol-related trauma, that is also part of that measurement, uh, that measurement tool, so we can tell you how many cases, uh, where it happens, what time it happens, and in actual fact, uh, uh, even in our violence prevention programs now, we're actually looking at how we uh, uh, deepen that data, 
so that it's not only about this person appeared in our hospital, uh, they were inebriated, they've got a gunshot wound or a knife wound, or they've been beaten up because of uh, alcohol abuse. Um, we don't want to know which hospital they arrived at and which hospital number it is. We actually want to know where that happened so that we can start to get that data. And that's the violence prevention data that's now getting expanded through this exact system in our hospital so that uh, we know that it happens at a certain uh, nightclub, pub, shabin, wherever it happens, or it's at home, uh, which streets, which districts, which towns. Uh, so we get a hotspot uh, 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 focus on where these uh, where these things are happening, how it's influencing our health system, and as of course, as the honourable member said, it costs us a huge amount of money that kind of that kind of trauma. And uh, I think these are some of the benefits that's come out of our learning, specifically now managing COVID nineteen and seeing the pressure on our front line, and you know, obviously seeing that that reduction in sales uh, was helping to reduce. Uh, our, our numbers of our trauma cases. And in, by doing that, we're actually learning lessons on dealing with regulation, on uh, understanding uh, different aspects of our ability to regulate. So definitely very, very key. And I can tell you that as a province, we understand uh, it better and better uh, each and every day, linking through the MRC, linking through with our universities and the work that our health department is doing to really get to better understand those trauma cases. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Premier, Honorable Members. I now recognize Honorable Maran, if you do wish to enjoy the benefit of the second opportunity. Speaker, definitely. Um, proceed. Thanks, Speaker. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm just getting to my last question, Speaker. The balance between uh, uh, saving lives and saving livelihoods, uh, Speaker, as that the, 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 the Premier weer that your economy can be stalwart, but as, as iemand so sterk, then as die for ever. As we bijvoorbeeld kijk in Breda Vallei, die Democratic, Democratic Alliance bijvoorbeeld, twee councillors verloor, die ene is a Speaker, as a fall van COVID. So that is the difference between saving lives and saving livelihoods. Speaker, can the Premier for us say, maybe for us say, what the role players in the drug bedrijf, say per day or any other enkele in the dia, rechtstreeks or onrechtstreeks, the Premier has said, on any other manier gerdelijk ondersteun word of bar die the drug bedrijf. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Maran. I recognise the Honourable Premier. I think the Honourable Member spoke about uh, the party, and of course, this is not a place to answer questions on the party. This is a place to answer questions on from government. Uh, so the answer is no. And then the second part of that answer is, um, you know, it was it was a, it was a similar question to the Honourable Dugmore that asked me uh, last week. I mean, he even used a, a name of someone last week to say that I met with this person. And I said, not to my recollection. I actually straight away sent a message through to my office and said, please go and have a look. And we, we trawled back to three years ago uh, when, when that person was last a member of parliament and uh, we couldn't find one, one meeting at all. But I also want to say to uh, the Honorable Moran that uh, there is also uh, linking business and government. Now, I want to say that it, it's interesting how the ANC... Uh, I mean, this is the second week talking about uh, the, the, this government and business and linking to business. I want to say absolutely. Um, Minister Mania and uh, Minister Mayer, who are responsible for agriculture or the economy, they need to meet with our businesses over and over and over again. Because one of the biggest complaints that we are getting from business, and whether it's us getting it, or our universities or business or the business chambers talking about it in South Africa. It is a structural problem where the ANC don't meet with business. You know, at this time of COVID-19, it's quite interesting. The president will make an announcement that affects thousands of jobs and there will be no consultation before making that announcement. I cannot believe that a government operates like that. Every single time we have a PCC, 
What happens is we ask our health department and we ask our economics departments to get together to have a look at the balance of lives and livelihoods. We ask for comment from both sides. We have engagements, whether it be through the liquor industry, through any kind of industry, uh, specifically at the moment, it's engagement with those industries hardest hit, the hospitality industry and all those SMMEs and small businesses that are linked to that industry. The smallest of the businesses in our province that the deba- uh, the questions dealt with from Honourable and Kondlaw today with the Honourable Minister of, of Economic Opportunities were specifically about support for SMMEs because those are the businesses that are so hard hit now during this crisis time. And quite frankly, it's unacceptable that at a national level, we do not engage. I can assure you that at this level, we engage and we have a robust debate in our strategy meetings so that we make the correct decisions. And our epidemiologists are in those meetings, our health departments in those meetings. That's why we've got measurements of trauma, but also the economy has to have a voice in those meetings if we are to be a responsible government trying to find that balance between lives and livelihoods. I'll give an example that uh, the previous Minister of Health Um, before he uh, was known for his digital vibes. That minister actually met with the liquor industry in this province. And it was interesting, after that minister meeting with the liquor industry, understanding the impact of a lockdown on our wine industry, on jobs, and on actually getting that balance right. Because can you imagine, I just visited one seller that had more than 10 million liters of wine in store, and that couldn't be sold. Obviously, because there were slowdowns, and times that they couldn't sell it. But imagine that gets dumped into the market afterwards because now you have to pay your bonds, you have to pay your salary, you have to pay back, or the banks are going to foreclose on you. So what do you do? You cheapen the price of your product and you dump it in the market. Imagine if that had to happen, what the consequences then are on lives versus livelihoods in our region. This takes careful management, balancing, and engagement across the board from all sides. And in actual fact, if the ANC could learn one thing during this pandemic and now in the third wave going towards the fourth wave, rather start consulting, rather start getting that balance right, because quite frankly, it is destroying jobs and lives, livelihoods and lives, the way it's being managed at the moment. We need to make sure we get that balance right. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Honourable Premier. Honourable Members, the time allocated to questions to the Premier, it's 20 minutes in terms of uh, Rule 204 and Subsection 2. And we have followed the rules uh, often in in terms of subsection nine of the same rule. And there was no rule that was broken, but the time is broken. So we need to end here. Uh, It's now 19 19 minutes, 43 seconds. So the former deputy chief of the majority party is nodding the minister there. So I'm glad that there's agreement. Um, I want to to say to the honorable members, thank you very much to the Honourable Premier and Honourable Maran, I apologise to the rest of the members who are lining up. I do know that you have forgiven me. We now move to member statements in terms of Rule 145. I now recognise the Democratic Alliance. Honourable Speaker, in a motion delivered in this House last week, the Honourable Syed launched unwarranted attack on the Creative Arts Conference hosted by Rustenburg Girls Junior School in partnership with the WCED. He claimed that it excluded teachers who could not afford the ticket and demanded that it be cancelled or made free. Speaker, it appears that the member had not done his homework, unfortunately. The fact is that the school approached sponsors so that tickets to the conference would be available for free to those who could not afford the 150 rand cost. Had Member Sayed bothered to simply have a look at the conference website, he would have seen this, plain as day. It is deeply concerning that a member of this House would so readily make such inaccurate comments in Parliament. Through you, Speaker, I encourage Member Sayed to publicly retract 
his remarks. His comments were yet another in a long line of easily disapproval claims he has made about the education sector. Unwarranted attacks do not constitute oversight. The conference itself was extremely successful, with nearly 2,000 attendees engaging on a variety of topics in creative arts education. The Democratic Alliance congratulates the organizers and affirms the importance of creative arts in equipping learners with the skills our economy needs now and will need in the future. I thank you. Apologies, um, honourable members. I'm just we're just changing shifts. And I have to just find myself. Thank you very much, honourable member. I now recognise the ANC. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, Deputy Speaker. The ANC wishes to condemn the serious lack of attention and support given to people living with disabilities in this province by the MEC and the Department of Social Development. On the 27th of July 2020, the MEC for Social Development announced the appointment of Ms. Nomvuyo Mabules to head the Provincial Disability Desk. A year later, we are informed by members of the disability community that the desk is vacant again. Surely this points to a systemic challenge within the department and an inability by the MEC to lead. When the global community is facing a pandemic such as COVID-19, all systems and structures are to be activated, especially in respect of vulnerable groups of our society. The lack of attention and urgency displayed by the MEC in this regard reiterates the elitist attitude that this provincial government has towards fighting COVID-19. When looking at the department's so-called easy read booklet containing information on COVID-19, one would think that this was for anyone and not designed specifically for members of our communities living with disabilities. Hardly anything in the booklet speaks to people with disabilities and support needs to be given to them. Deputy Speaker, international trends suggest that between 15% of a population, any part of the world, is affected by disability. This means approximately 765,000 people in our province have a disability of one sort or another. Local organizations suggest that in the West Cape, the more realistic figure may be higher. One wonders whether the department itself and the MEC are aware of how many people in our province are affected by disabilities. Yet this kind of information and the role of the community with disabilities in fighting COVID-19 should be championed by the disability desk in this department. However, like many other vulnerable groups, this MEC in a lack of leadership is leaving many behind. So for over one year, we have no disability desk in the very department that is mandated to have one. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. And I recognise the EFF. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the EFF in the Western Cape would like to take this opportunity to condemn in the strongest possible terms the disgust and inhuman and negligent conduct in the city of Cape Town for not attending to its constitutional duties of service delivery in poor black communities. This follows an incident in which the two-year-old Imtan the Swat boy was found dead after falling and drowning into a sewerage manhole, uh, which has been left unattended by the city of Cape Town, despite numerous calls to the city by the Kailisha residents requesting the drain to be, to be covered. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the incidents of this nature are very common in townships and informal settlement, as the city does not care about the safety and the well-being of the poor people living in these areas. If the very same drainage system would have been reported openly in the, in the leafy suburbs, it would have been taken only a few minutes for the city to rush to the area and close it down in order to protect children of the rich and the white people. It is so sad to live in a city which deliberately flaunt its constitutional duties of providing basic services to certain communities only because of the color of their skin and economic status. Poor people in our townships remain neglected by those in government and are only remembered when it's time to cast their votes. This situation is so bad and gambles with the human lives at the expense of certain individuals scoring seats in the councils and then go back to ignore 
the very same people who put their, them in power. As the EFF Deputy Speaker, I would like to send our heartfelt and deepest condolences to the family of Imtan the Swat Boy. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. And I recognise the DA. Um, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Just a moment. Um, <laughs> Deputy Speaker, um, the recent audit outcomes revealed that 18 of 30 municipalities in the Western Cape achieved clean audits. Nine municipalities achieved an unqualified audit report. Oford West is the only municipality that achieved the worst possible audit outcome, which is a disclaimer. Deputy Speaker, this means that 90% of our municipalities achieved a clean or unqualified audit. This is not surprising. These municipalities are all led or was led by the DA, while those with adverse audit outcomes are all governed by the ANC. Western Cape residents can be assured that their monies are well not stolen, jobs are not given to friends and family, and public services are efficiently rendered. When the people of the Western Cape go to the polls in the upcoming elections, it is important, an important question to ask is this, who do you trust? Do you trust the ANC, which does not pay even its own workers? Do you trust a party whose municipalities require intervention and support from the provincial government to help them deliver services? Or do you trust those small and yana parties who make outlandish promises because they do not have any track record in government? Of course you don't. Or do you trust a party in government, both provincially and locally? Deputy Speaker, the people of the Western Cape are much the wiser because they deserve better than ANC's lies and not so good political mania. Western Cape residents know they have a home when they vote for clean governance, ethical leadership, and a party that gets the job done. This deputy thank speaker you. is the DA. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. Now recognise Bird. I take it that Honourable Heron is not there. He's on the uh, last last call for Honourable Heron. Okay, I'm going to move on to the ACDP. If he's got a problem with technicality, please, uh, we'll, I will come back to him, um, to the ACDP. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, statistics released by the World Health Organization uh, 2020 show a suicide occurs every 40 seconds and a suicide attempt every three, three seconds. It shows 800,000 die by suicide each year. Suicide is a second leading cause of death in the world's population of 15 to 29 years old. In this country, South Africa, an average suicide of 17.2 per 100,000 or 8% of all death. This only reflects death reported by academic hospitals. Deputy Speaker, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group reports that 20% of high school learners in South Africa have tried at a point to take their own lives. 9% of young people deaths are labeled as suicide. Um, you, uh, Jason Bankies, a senior professor lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch, says, and I quote, for every suicide death, there are estimated to be at least another 20 suicide attempts. Some students show that as many as 35 people are seriously affected by each suicide, close quote. Literature on youth suicide referred to school-age children between the ages of 7 and 12 and adolescents between the ages of 13 
and 20 years old. Young people of these ages are vulnerable to mental health problems, especially during their adolescent years. They are often confronted by high expectations from relatives to perform at their best. This results in conditions of helplessness, stress, and the loss of self-confidence. The ACDP calls on the Western Cape government to, to move vigorously support initiatives such thank as... Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Apologies for the interruption there. Thank you very much. Um, I now recognize the ANC. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, we have always maintained that the DA does not take serious arts, sports and culture in the province. There are many examples to prove this, but the decision to cut funding from the Western Cape School of Sport will go down in history as the worst decision ever by this department. Due to the provincial government's nonchalant attitude towards arts, sports and culture, many artists and organizations have since relied on the support from national government for survival. For the current financial year, Deputy Speaker, the Department of Arts and Culture has contributed over 29.5 million for art, African arts, culture, education and sports trusts. This was paid directly to individuals and organizations in the Western Cape. A total of 666 beneficiaries received funding from the National Department up until mid-August. In addition to this, over 1.5 million has been paid to support organizations in the filming industry in the Western Cape. The ANC in the Western Cape commands the National Department under the stewardship, stewardship of Minister Natim Tetra. The assistance in this department in the Western Cape is appreciated and it goes a long way to give hope and a chance of survival to many organizations that were beginning to lose hope following the devastating impact of COVID-19. Deputy Speaker, we call on more national government departments to follow suit and bring more national investment to this province where majority of artists and organizations are not funded by the provincial government. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. And I recognize the DA. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, a few weeks ago, the province experienced some of the most devastating disruptions to the taxi industry we have seen in recent times. The Western Cape government and Minister Dalen Mitchell made the correct decision to close Route B97, bringing calm and stability to the situation and protecting Western Cape commuters. Throughout the period, Minister Mitchell, Premier Windy, and National Minister Mbalula worked tirelessly to bring an end to the disruption. Minister Mitchell took the following key steps. He invoked his powers in terms of Section 91 of the NLTSA to close the ranks. He had numerous engagements with the parties involved, including through an arbitration process. The National Minister actually supported him during this progress, uh, process, including lending his signature to the ceasefire agreement. The SAPs and law enforcement, as well as the SANDF, also assisted during the enforcement progress, and the City of Cape Town and the Department of Community Safety, led by Minister Albert Fritz, played a crucial role in dealing with law enforcement and supported the government in this crucial work. This coordinated approach sends a benchmark of what can be achieved in cooperative governance when politics are set aside. However, we are concerned with the extremely low conviction rate of individuals involved in the taxi violence. We urge the National Prosecuting Authority to prioritize those individuals who were involved in sanctioning those crimes in the taxi industry so that justice is seen to be done and felt for the victims of these crimes. The over 700,000 passengers who use the minibus taxi industry every day must be able to travel safely in the Western Cape. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. And now recognize the Freedom Front Plus. Thank you very much, Speaker, Deputy Speaker. The Freedom Front Plus is greatly concerned about the poor performance of Kanalan local municipality comprising the towns of Ladysmith, Kalitsdorp and Zoa. Currently, this municipality is under ANC control. It has led me to the conclusion that the Minister of Local Government in the Western Cape may have failed in his duties and that he should appoint a committee to advise him on what the most appropriate remedial action would be to resolve this matter. I will be tabling 
a motion at our next plenary session in this regard, hoping that the demarcation board could be asked to investigate possible adjustments to the municipal boundaries of Kandalant to increase its administrative and financial capacity to benefit the communities living there. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. I now recognise Al Jamar. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. Speaker, the martyr Steve Bantu Biko said, and I quote, a people without a positive history is like a vehicle without an engine. As South Africans and citizens of the Western Cape, we have a proud history of resistance against colonialism and unjust laws. The Khoi and San tribes have fought the Dutch settlers since 1659 against occupation of their land. Other resistances were that of Muslim political prisoners brought by the colonialists as slaves to South Africa. And of course, we, are, we all uh, also remember the several resistance campaigns against an apartheid regime. So yes, indeed, we do have a positive history as our people stood up against oppression and colonial, colonialism. Pika also quoted, I am against the fact that the settler minority should impose an, an entire system of values on an indigenous people. Today, we find that tourism pitched to boost local economy still produces colonial dynamics of the inequality existing between white and black tourism industry. Thus, the legacy of colonialism remains a stark reminder in the tourism industry. Our positive and proud history have been reduced to memory, to, to memory walls in the townships of the Cape Flats. The statues of the Guguletu 7 are admirable, but unfortunately neglected. In Drakenstein and other rural areas, the pictures, of, of the pictures and landscapes depict the history of colonialism. The first political hangings were that of Poco members from Paul, but there is nothing to depict that history. It is unacceptable that previously disadvantaged communities are forced to continue with resistance campaigns against historical sites being turned into new, uh, new lib liberal imperatives for economic growth and development. I am referring to the River Club development, which is, which is on a site sacred to the Khoi and San tribes who fought the Dutch settlers against the dispossession of the land. The Cape Malay Choir Board are also deprived from using the Goodhope Center for its competitions. We call on the province to ensure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you, you very much. I now recognize the Democratic Alliance. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Fellow South Africans, September marks the start of Tourism Month in South Africa, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic and related regulations, many tourism businesses have already shut their doors and may never open again. Others are hanging on for dear life. With decreasing numbers of COVID-19 infections, the Western Cape exiting its peak of its third wave, and with continued rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations, it is time for national government to ease up lockdown regulations. We cannot live under continuous lockdown regulations day in and day out with no end in sight. Regulations such as the curfew, restrictions on alcohol sales, attendance at sports events and gathering sizes need to be revisited especially the gathering is work-related, such as conferences and meetings. Every regulation imposed on a business in the particular sector also has a knock-on effect for businesses in the value chain. If a large hotel is unable to fill its rooms and conference venues, then the local laundromat might suffer. If businesses are unable to sell alcohol during certain times or on certain premises, it affects bottling and labeling companies and logistic businesses alike. Restrictions on attendance at sports events and gatherings affect local and informal entrepreneurs who regularly sell their goods at these events. The tourism industry is estimated to have lost more than 75,000 jobs in 2020. And in order for the sector to survive, it needs to be able to capitalize on the upcoming spring and summer months, as well as the opening of travel from Germany, France and the Netherlands to the South Africa. 
Tourism is a top employment sector in the Western Cape, and the DA thus calls upon the national government to where it can safely be done to ease up restrictions so that tourism businesses and its value chain can keep their doors open and our tourist sectors can once again thrive. As always, to give hope to our residents, we need to balance lives and livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. That brings us to the end of statements. In terms of Rule 145.6, I now give one of the more members of the Executive an opportunity to respond for not more than five minutes collectively. Are there any ministers who would like to respond? Honourable Speaker, if I may, my hand is up if you'd recognise me. I recognise you, Honourable Fernandes. Uh, Minister Fernandes, you may, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Honourable Speaker, the Premier, members of the House. I would like to use the opportunity, I think, to set the record straight regarding the Honourable Doug Moore's inputs on the disability desk. I think there are two key factors that must be taken into account. I think if I can state for the record, we were the only province that had established a disability desk. It was done at a time to complement the additional disability program that we have. However, with the changing of the DPSA, when the regulations changed, we had to then extend that contract on an annual basis, year to year, and that proved to be cumbersome. So in fact, what we did, um, we took the disability desk and we mainstreamed it by actually appointing a second deputy director to the post of disability. And that was done recently. So we improved the arrangement by replacing the temporary disability desk post with a permanent one. And in that way, we have mainstreamed. I also think it is disingenuous of the Honourable Dagmo to suggest that there is privilege. Just on Saturday, I had the opportunity to address the RETS 21 conference. And as you may know, RETS is a disability that affects more girl children than boy children. And this was conducted at Ida's house where I had the opportunity to do oversight and actually observe the equine and the dog therapy that they use for severely disabled persons. So we do have a close relationship with the disability network and I have on two occasions attended the AGM. So the Honourable Doug must first get his facts right regarding the establishment of the department and not come and uh, speak untruths to Parliament and make it out as if, as if it is gospel. So our disability program is up and running and we are seized. It is one of my four priorities, disability, substance use disorder, gender-based violence and strengthening families. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Fernandes. Any further input from the ministers? I don't see any hands. I then take it that we have come to the end of member statements. Um, Honourable, um, that's fine. We now move over to notices of motion in terms of uh, the new rule 151. All notices of motions by members are required to be delivered to the secretary for placing it onto the order paper. These motions have been duly submitted and published in the order paper below the line. Uh, we now move to motions without notice. I'd like to inform you once again that in terms of the new standing rules 150 pertaining to motions without notice, condolence and congratulatory were submitted to the programming authority prior to this plenary on the 31st of August 2021. Members are also reminded that the motions without notice pertaining to these congratulatory or condolences will not be allowed in this sitting that have not been processed by the programming authority. I've been informed that in the Programming Authority meeting of 31st of August 2021, political parties did submit the names of the honourable members in their desired order of speaking and who had wished to move a motion without notice in this sitting of the House. I will therefore, just for noting and for the purposes of the minutes, call out the honourable members whose names have accordingly been submitted and approved. The following member motions have been approved by the Programming Authority as follows. Honourable Allen, Honourable Christians, Honourable Bosman, Honourable Boerta, Honourable Syed, Honourable Boerta, Honourable Mbimbi, 
Honourable Mackenzie and Honourable Barnes. I now put the motions duly submitted and approved by the Programming Authority to the House. Are there any objections? No objections. None. Thank you. No objections. Agreed to. The motions will appear in the minutes of the proceedings and in Hansard in each individual member's name as if that member has read them out aloud. I will now afford the opportunity to members to move motions without notice as per the standing rule of 153D. This includes motions without notice that were not approved in the programming authority meeting. Members are re reminded that the 30 minutes as per standing rule will start now. In the order of the list that I have, I now recognize Honorable Moran. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, motion without notice that this House commence the efforts by the Honorable Khalid Said in resolving the transport crisis for kids uh, from the previous Irish Quela Primary School to travel to the new De Dorings Primary School in Stofla, and that these kids until last Friday had been without transport since the opening of the new school at the beginning of the current school quarter where they were eventually placed. I so moved. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion being moved without notice? Yes. There are objections. The motion will be printed on the order paper. Thank you. I recognize Honorable Makamba Bortia. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move without notice that the House condemns the seat of Cape Town over its celebration for spending 95% of its urban settlement development. Honourable Kamabotia, your sound has, we can't hear you. Honourable Kamabotia, what I'm going to do is, um, Honourable Winger, I see your hand is... One the main One that Honourable comes to mind is the story of a 27 foot. Honourable Kamabotia, if you can just take your seat for a second. Honourable Winger, Chief Whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. No, it was just to note that I, uh, we couldn't hear the Honourable Member, and so we don't know if we can agree or, or not. Yes, correct. So what I'm going to ask Honourable Mukama Bocha, you can try one more time. If not, I'm going to move on until you've actually fixed up your sound. If you can try that once again. Should I start from the beginning, uh, Deputy Speaker? I can hear you clearly now. You may proceed from the beginning, please. Okay, uh, the, uh, I move without notice, uh, Deputy Speaker, that the House condemns the city of Cape Town over its celebration for spending 95% of its urban settlement development grant budget for the 2020-2021 financial year. It cannot be right that the city celebrates exhausting almost all of its funds, whereas in reality, we do not see changes in informal settlements as majority of people still live in congested areas made up of shack structures. One of the many examples that come to mind is the story of a 27-year-old disabled Busiswa Pikinini who has no feet and hands and resides in Kailicha informal settlement in section RR. Busiswa, who lives with a family of four in a congested shack and has previously applied for a state house in the past 10 years without any luck, instead of the city assisting her to get a state house, they have instead run to the media to say they cannot find her on the list of applicants. This just shows that the city has no regard for the principles and values of Ubuntu and Bantu Pili, which would ordinarily prioritize the elderly and people with disabilities, and not only in policy documents, but in actual reality, by making an impact in people's lives. I so move. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any objections to the motion being moved without notice? Without notice? Yes. Yes, objection. yes objections. The motion will be put on of, the point of, point of information. Guys. Um, I, I recognize a second. Language. Honorable Maria, what's your point of order? And the motion is contradictory. It says I commend the council for doing something wrong, and then she blam blasts the council. It cannot be that she commends them. The Honourable Marie, thank you so much for the explanation, but it is not for us to uh, to analyse the actual motion that the Honourable Member has put forward. We may proceed. I now move over to Honourable Sayed. 
Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. I move without notice that this House condemns the irresponsible and insensitive manner in which the Western Cape Education Department has dealt with the positive testing case of the Deputy Principal at Kensington High School, fueling the anxieties of the school community and calls on the WCED to ensure that decontamination of schools occurs, uh, that decontamination of schools um, basically take place timelessly when positive cases occur, especially among staff, so as to stop the rapid spread, the, the, the rapid spread and mutation of the COVID-19 virus. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion be moved without notice? Yes, objections. There are objections. The motion will be printed on the order paper. I recognize Honorable Mkamba Bortia again. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move without notice that the House notes the lack of basic infrastructure for water drainage systems in the Cape Town informal settlements. The EFF has constantly been vocal about the issue, but this issue, but our calls have always been falling onto deaf ears. The situation becomes worse during the rainy season and as in recent times when there is flooding. Western Cape needs a proactive metropolitan, which is able to assist the poor and the needy who resides in deplorable conditions in areas such as Mau Mau, Kualanga, Nyanga East, and Cryfontaine. Just to mention the few, I so move, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Are there any objections to the motion being moved without notice? Yes. Yes, yes. objection. Yes. There are objections. The motion will be printed on the order paper. I recognize Honorable Moran. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Speaker, on behalf of the African National Congress, motors without notice, that this house, after numerous complaints by communities, considers getting a full senior bar council opinion, whether it is legal for municipalities to sum, to summarily deduct municipal accounts in arrears or in agency, agency basis for any creditor first when residents buy electricity. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion being moved without notice? Check. Deputy Speaker, we, uh, don't know, sorry, we don't know what he's asking. Uh, no, Honourable Member, it's, uh, I've seen an objection. That's all I need to know. Thank you. The um, motion will be printed on the order paper. I now recognise Honourable Sayed. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. I move without notice on behalf of the African National Congress that the House condemns the irresponsible... Uh, the, the, that the House condemns the irresponsible manner in which the Education MEC, Debbie Schaefer, has victimized a member of the public, a parent, and a whistleblower, Mr. Kassant Abada, during last week's sitting, a platform where Mr. Abada cannot defend himself after he publicly exposed her department's failure to properly address allegations of corruption against the former principal at Golden Grove Primary School. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to, to oh, the yes. motion being moved? Yes, two for defamation, I think. Uh, there are objections. The motion will be printed on the order paper. Honourable Maria, I see your hand was up again. I hope it's on an explanation on the content of the motions. I do apologise. I failed to lower it, Deputy Speaker. Your apologies accepted, but I... Uh, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. We now move over to the order of the day. The Secretary will read the order of the day. Consideration of the report of the Conduct Committee on a complaint against an Honourable Member of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament in accordance with the Code of Conduct for Members of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, dated 7 May 2021. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I've been informed by the Chief Whip that the Programming Authority resolved that there would be no list of speakers and that parties who wish to do so will now be afforded an opportunity to make a declaration of the vote for a maximum of three minutes. I recognize the ANC. Any declaration? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The, the ANC. Am I audible, Speaker? Yes, you may proceed. Um, one minute, Honorable 
Um, Lekker, okay, Honourable Philander, I will call you when the time is right. I'm assuming you're waiting in to do a declaration. I recognise the ANC first. Over to you, Honourable Lekker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The ANC wishes to note this complaint and the report tabled here today. We will not go so far as to welcome the report because this complaint should never have made uh, have been made in the first place. The complaint speaks to an old apartheid-like style thinking, where one cannot speak out, and in particular, the complaint speaks to a serious lack of appreciation for democracy and parliamentary privilege. This complaint questioned the very foundation of our democracy. It comes from a place where black people may not question wealthy white businessmen in our country. In other words, the thinking behind this complaint was, how dare this black man speaks out and question me? This mentality has no place in our democracy. We will defeat this sense of white privilege. Every single member of this house, no matter what race, gender or class, may pose questions, may criticize and may debate any issues that the Constitution allows us to do so. It is astounding that 27 years into our democracy that this mentality is exposed in this manner. At least we would have thought this particular complaint would have the shame to rather hide his, th this particular complainant would have the shame to rather hide such a complaint, not so when it comes to white men privilege. This bombastic bus mentality when it comes to some white men knows no bounds. At least we thank the conduct committee for rising to the occasion. The ANC requests members of this house who are friends with this DA funder to speak to him and teach him about the new South Africa. While some in the Western Cape may think they can dismiss constitutional imperatives of our country, <clears throat> sorry, would hope all members of this house recommit themselves to these constitutional imperatives and dismiss this racist, classist mentality that moved this complaint in the first place. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. I now recognise the EFF. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The EFF is not making any declaration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I check that um, Honourable Heron is making a declaration? Uh, Deputy Speaker, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, Honourable I Heron. Have a declaration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I assume that was no, yes. Um, can I call on the ACDP? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, the complaint against fellow member Honorable Smith is worrying. The fact that this matter was referred to the con uh, Conduct Committee for, invest for investigation is even more disturbing. As members of this House, we are protected by the powers, privileges and immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislature Act. The Constitution of South Africa assures members of this House freedom of speech and immunity from civil and criminal prosecution. Is this a ploy from the DA trying to curb freedom of speech? Is the DA trying to intimidate members so that we will not uh, participate in robust debates? This matter should have been dealt with sent to the complainant and says members are protected. Uh, it's quite amazing to see that this matter was brought for investigation to the conduct committee. It's disgusting and we will not be intimidated uh, by unnecessary and frivolous investigations. I uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. I now recognise the Freedom Front Plus. Uh, Deputy Chair, the Freedom Front Plus has no declaration, declaration to make. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. I now recognise Al Jama. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Al Jama is covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognise the Democratic Alliance. 
Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the Registrar having presented his report, the committee deliberated on the matter and resolved that no further action need to be taken against the Honorable Member. The complainant, which was a member of the public, complained that certain remarks made by Honorable Smith during the debate on the State of the Province address at the hybrid parliamentary sitting held on the 18th of February 2021 at Genadendal were defamatory of the complainant. The hybrid sitting at Genadendal satisfies the definition of parliamentary precincts contained in sections 2.1 and 2.2 of the powers, privileges and immunities of parliaments and provincial legislatures act number four of 20 of rather 2004. Section 1171 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa provides that members of the provincial legislatures enjoy freedom of speech and immunity from civil or criminal prosecution or damages for anything said in the legislature. That is during a formal sitting of the House. The remarks made by Honorable Smith took place during an official sitting of the House and are therefore covered by parliamentary privilege as set out in Section 117 of the Constitution. Nonetheless, Deputy Speaker, the complainant enjoys a right of reply in terms of Section 25 of the powers, privileges and immunities of Parliaments and Provincial Legislatures Act No. 4 of 2004. The committee deliberated and found that no further action be taken against Honorable Member Smith and no breach of the code has occurred. The committee further deliberated and resolved that the Secretary to Parliament be instructed to write to the complainant drawing his attention to his right of reply and inquiring if the complainant wished to make a written reply. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the decision concurred with the recommendation of the Registrar and recommended by the Conduct Committee on the 25th of August 2021. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I therefore encourage this House to accept the recommendation of the Conduct Committee. I so move, Deputy Speaker. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Honorable Member. I now have to announce that there are currently 35 honourable members present and entitled to vote, and the House is therefore quorum. The question put before the House is that the report of the Conduct Committee on a complaint against honourable member of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, in accordance with the Code of Conduct for members of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, dated 7 May 2021, be adopted. Are there any objections to the report being adopted? No. no. There are no objections agreed to. Honourable members, that concludes the business for the day. The Secretary will now end the meeting and all members will be exited from this meeting. The House is adjourned. <laughs>